So, if Cretaceous extinction, Cambrian extinction, so we uh, the choice could be Cambrian extinction, pre Cambrian extinction that stands really odd because pre Cambrian there was no much life. Pre Cambrian extinction, say C was given as a recent or Cenozoic extinction, and another choice given was it could be the Permian extinction. So, for such a question wherein which is the worst of all extinction, the answer would rightly be the Permian extinctions here. This is one of the worst extinctions which erased nearly 80 percentage of the population. So, the answer is Permian extinction, but if a question is asked which of the following is a worst extinction which erased which is erasing mammals, then the answer would be the recent or Cenozoic era. So, the Cenozoic era is losing mammals every minute, but in a Permian uh, extinction nearly 80 percentage of the species are lost. So, uh, the world was again reformed in 6 mass extinctions we are undergoing we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 out of which we are undergoing 6th extinction where we are losing mammals. So, again earth has witnessed life flourished, life formed, life took pains to form then after it formed it started diverging and then erased and then reformed life then again erased reformed life and then erased likewise there are 6 extinctions which happened in this planet and now we are undergoing the 6th extinction. So, it is an ongoing process one species will be there in the geological period only for a certain period of time. So, uh, if you look at dinosaurs or you call it as uh, Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous era where the dinosaurs rule the earth those mighty reptiles they rule the earth however they, they are erased from earth because of their tiny brain. So, man is now ruling the roost in sixth we call it as Cenozoic era. So, anyhow according to the laws any species can sustain in this earth only for a definite period or a definite geological period. Now, we are here in the sixth uh, period which we call it as Cenozoic, but how far will man rule the roost we have no idea. Now, let us go for the theories of evolution. There were many theories of evolution proposed the catastrophism, panspermia, by Cuvier, where it is said that catastrophes were responsible for the evolution of organisms in this planet. Then there was also panspermia, there are even believers of this panspermia. Okay, where they believe that life came not from this planet as such, it came from external or extraterrestrial or we call it as exoplanets okay, or alien life that is what is a panspermia. Even Stephen Hawking's believe it that life could have been from external sources okay, other than earth that is what is uh, panspermia. Then there are also believers of abiogenesis even great thinkers like Aristotle, Plato, they also believe that life came from inanimate or you call it as non-life things. So, life came from non-life things was a proposal for abiogenesis where some of the great philosophers believe it including Aristotle, including Plato. But however, we come to know that uh, this was not accepted and they proposed biogenesis law, okay, theory of biogenesis and here abiogenesis or spontaneous generation was not believed anymore. It could have been the case in the primitive earth. As of now, the spontaneous generation life from inanimate or you call it as non life organ, non life things is not possible today. So, uh, people be, you know broke this law and biogenesis was the another theory proposed by Louis Pasteur, Spallanzani, Francisco Ridi. Now, let us look at the theories. So, after panspermia that believers as I said even including Stephen Hawking believes that life came from exoplanets. 
then we can talk about the spontaneous generation where they believe that if uh, uh, they hang a shirt which is very dirty, rat came out of it in 21 days. So, uh, then if a uh, wheat flour or uh, any rice flour is kept sealed, then when we open it, uh, the beetles fly out of it. So, we have to understand then it is not the wheat which is going to be converted into beetles, it is the air which has pores or settle on the floor and then that leads to the formation of beetles. So, this was uh, understood much later because many people believed in spontaneous generation where from the muddy water came the frogs, from the dirty sh shirt hung in the barn came the rats likewise. So, it was all not believed now anymore, then it took time for uh, biogenesis to be accepted because the classical we call it a swan neck experiment. Where what they did in swan neck experiment was with an S shaped swan neck experiment, they grew, they boiled broth with meat in it and what they thought is if the meat is perfectly sealed, it is boiled, it is sterilized and here the S, S shaped neck is also sealed, then what happens is it remains unspoiled for more than a week which clearly shows that the air is the one which is spoiling the food product or air is the one which is spoiling the, uh, which is responsible for the conversion of we call so called call uh, believe in abiogenesis. So, now biogenesis is the one which says that air is the one which is responsible for formation of life as it, as in those experiments which were, which where people believed it is abiogenesis like muddy water from the muddy water came the frogs, okay. Then uh, from the dirty shirt came the rats or from the wheat floor came the beetles. Now, it is not, not anymore accepted because we come to know it is the air which is responsible for ha carrying the spores and settling the spores in the broth which is responsible for this uh, spoilage, okay. That was biogenesis law. Then, so now people have understood that it is no more spontaneous generation. Now, the life in this planet started from life only, another life, a life gave rise to another life today. Maybe in the earlier atmosphere as we have seen from co-acervates to protobion, protobion to eobion, to eobion to uh, then uh, the primitive life that is chemoheterotroph, chemoheterotroph to then it became autotroph, then again heterotroph, then the first prokaryote, then the first eukaryote. So, however, now that after this understanding, then we need to know uh, how this species diverged. For this again the theories of evolution now from the abiogenesis we believe in now biogenesis. Now, we are going ahead with the other theories proposed by various people. So, recapitulation theory, the way use and disuse theory, use and disuse theory by Lamarck, Lamarck. Then Darwin's theory of da, theories of evolution, Darwin's of theories of evolution. Darwin's theories of evolution had an impact in all fields because the perspective, the mindset of people changed after Darwin's theories of evolution. Now, let us focus on use and disuse, then also recapitulation theory by Ernst Haeckel. Recapitulation theory by Ernst Haeckel. In use and disuse theory as proposed by Lamarck, what he observes it, when a particular organ is excessively used or if you are honing a particular skill, that particular skill will be uh, attained at a maximum rate. So, if you use a particular organ effectively, the organ will become more effective. Then if you do not use a particular organ, this will become rudimentary organ, okay, that is disuse organ. So, let us see what is this use or disuse theory. So, in use theory what we uh, come to know understanding is uh, in giraffe, he observed that uh, giraffe had the fossil giraffes were short necked whereas, the giraffe today we have are long necked. So, why this kind of uh, discrepancy is because the fossil giraffe were short necked, today's giraffes were long necked. It is because they say according to Lamarck, he says that uh, there was competition for food, for food reserves there was competition and the giraffes wanted to reach the canopy 
So, forest canopy to have no competition where there will be less competition. So, to access the food reserves which are found on the top of the uh, trees or you call it as tree canopy, then these giraffes started stretching their necks. When they started stretching their necks, this uh, neck became very long. So, and then they enjoyed the food which is present in the canopy with little competition than those who were having a short neck suffered from competition from other organisms, uh, other uh, uh, other animals. So, as a result the when a particular organ is effectively used that particular organ will be uh, will become more and more skilled. Now, let, let us look at disuse theory. What is disuse? If you do not use a particular organ and that particular organ will be uh, become rudimentary or vestige. Okay, so, acquired. So, the, uh, here what he also observes it an organ which is used effectively will be acquired in the next generation as well as an organ which is not used also will be acquired in the, uh, the theory of acquired inheritance. So, he also believes in the acquired inheritance, it will be inherited, but now we come to an understanding that it cannot be acquired anymore, it is not, it will not fall under acquired in inheritance. Now, let us uh, uh, see the example for disuse theory. So, a cave dweller, so a cave dweller wherein the sunlight uh, will not be shown on them, such animals will have even though they have eyes, the, the photoreceptor cells are there, however, they are not going to use it as a result they will become blind. So, cave dwellers of, though they have eyes, it is of no use like you take the flying foxes, we call them as uh, the mammal, uh, flying mammal uh, bats. If you take bats for example, bats though they are cave dwellers, they can see one or uh, they cannot see the thing is they use their ears ultrasound for detecting the. Uh, huddles or hindrances. They do not use their eyes because they, I, though they use a, a eyes, it, it is so dark inside the cave. And likewise, deep sea fishes, deep sea fishes also became blind because the light will not go down to the sea floor. Uh, though they have eyes, it is of no use because there is no light, they are not going to use eyes and in future they became blind. So, however, we come to an understanding that it is not acquired anymore, though it can be a use and disuse theory by Lamarck or Lamarckism, it is also referred as Lamarckism, we come to an understanding today that it is not inherited in the following generations. Okay. Now, let us take this uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. So, it was Thomas Malthus, an economist who influenced Charles Darwin in proposing this theories of evolution as a descent of man was another important book of Charles Darwin in which he proposed that if there is increase in population, the increase in population, when the increase in population is going on, what will happen is the resources will become limited. When the resources is going to become li limited, then there will be competition among themselves. And when there is competition among themselves, only the survival of the fittest, only the fittest will survive, all the rest will be erased according to Darwin. Again, we have uh, uh, variations, we can deviate from the Darwin's theories also because we find that the world gives space not only for the fittest and also for the mediocres or the not so fittest also is given space. So, let us see here the Malthusian essay on population, the, the, his essay on population in influenced uh, Darwin, essay on population in influenced Darwin in proposing this theories of evolution and descent of man. So, in which he says that when the population increases, it leads to limited resources. When there is limited resources, then there will be survival of the fittest and the only fittest will make it that is according to Darwin. And then come we come to an understanding today that, uh, that uh, the world gives space not only for the fittest or also for other organisms, not so fittest are also given space for in this world. Now, let us, uh, but however, his adventure in HMS Beagle across uh, Galapagos Islands and Galapagos Finches, Darwin's Finches, so called we call it as Darwin's Finches gave him an understanding about what is adaptive radiation, which can be accepted because adaptive radiation is the one which is responsible for diversity of organisms based on their habitat. So, based on the habitat, each organism is going to have its own adaptation. So, uh, Finches finches are de deviated, for, so the finches some of them were eating the worms, they were spoon billed, worm eaters, some were worm eaters, 
some were nutcrackers. nutcrackers, some were uh, plant eaters or you call it as cacti eaters likewise. So, based on where they live, based on the habitat, this particular organism will adapt itself. For example, if you take the bears, so the bear in India drinks honey, but bear in US will prefer salmons. Again, bears in uh, polar, polar regions will prefer sea lions and then sea lions likewise. So, uh, based on their where they live, the habitat, a particular organism will change its habitat, will change its food reserve and the way, the mode of eating and everything. So, they became spoon built, those who are worm eaters become spoon built, those who are nut crackers had the parrot of parrot's uh, beak where it can crack the nut and extract the food from nutrients from it and those who are cacti eaters had long beak. Likewise, it all modified and that led, led to the diversity. And also when we talk about adaptive radiation, we can also talk about the isolation. We call it as geographical isolation. So, some of the organisms were isolated geographically like the one, like the animals of Australia. If you look at the animals of Australia, we call them as marsupials. There are three kinds of mammals. When we talk about Kinozoigira, there are three kinds of mammals. Uh, that is uh, Prototheria, then Eutheria and Metatheria. So, the mammal diversity started only around Kinozoigira and these mammals are categorized into the primitive mammals supposed to be the Prototheria which means egg laying mammal, then metatheria, then eutheria. Metatherians are pouched mammals like marsupials. Metatherians are pouched ma mammals like marsupials of Australia. Then eutheria, eutheria are placental mammals including man, placental mammals. So now let us see uh, how this geographical isolation and uh, mammalian diversity happened in Australia. So inside Australia, Australia is an, as an island and it is it was long separated. So we migrated from Gondwana region. So the uh, land mass started moving Pangaea, we call it as Pangaea and the land mass started moving only during the Mesozoic era. Then Australia attains its position only in the Kinozoic uh, era. As a result, the organisms which are found in Australia will be found nowhere only in America. So, if you look at opposum, opposum will be present in Australia and as well as it is also found in American countries. But other mammals like pouched mammals, all those pouched mammals, uh, the kangaroos, the co the kangaroos and then wombat, wallaby. So, all these mammals will not be found anywhere else in this world because they are totally isolated. So, they are in an island. So, organisms will only circulate around the Australian island. So, they only revolved around this. So, we have this marsupials diversity, we call it as adaptive radiation. They started diverging into wombat, wallaby, kangaroo, red kangaroo. kangaroo rat and much more and this diversity was confined within Australia because they did not have a chance to mingle with the mainland animals. As a result, only we can find these pouched mammals only in, on and only in Australia. Okay, that is also another example for ad adaptive radiation other than Darwin's finches, other than the bears which we discussed. So, an organism based on the availability of resources, they adapt themselves, they modify themselves structurally and morphologically. And then uh, if they are separated, geographically separated, you, they are confined within a particular region like this one in marsupials. Now, we will go for the third theory which we were discussing. theory of recapitulation, ontogeny repeats phylogeny, where we say ontogeny repeats phylogeny by Haeckel. So, 
So, what he observes in uh, ontogeny repeats phylogeny is the embryological evidence of a mammal, a bird and an amphibian and a reptile had similar features in the beginning and then they had shared the common features in the beginning and then they developed specialized cha characters much later. That was the observe, that was what was observed by this German Haeckel in which he, the embryological evidences prove that uh, shows that uh, these organisms starting from amphibian or reptile or a bird will share some of the common features. Then they developed spe special characters only much later in upon development that was the view of Haeckel. So, he over emphasized on certain factors and he give, gave, uh, gave little importance to other factors that is why it is not fully accepted though we make a mention when whenever we talk about in evolution. Now, let us go ahead with after having understood that life started from the primitive organisms and then we will now talk about life how it started for man. So, evolution of man. So, very important evolution of man we are going to discuss. So, before that we also have to understand what are these analogous organs and homologous organs. This is a question very much repeated in NEAT. So, we have to distinguish what are homologous organs and what are analogous organs. So, homologous organs are from same origin, but their functions are different. Anatomically they are same and then anatomically similar same origin, but functions are different. Functionally they are different, such organs are called homologous organs. If we look at the what is a homolog analogous organ, analogous organs are functionally same, functionally will do the same work, same functionally similar and origin as well anatomy would be different, origin wise and anatomically they are different that is an a analogous organ. So, what uh, from the neat perspective the type of question asked is ok. From neat perspective the type of question asked is like uh, eye of octopus and eye of man. Flight muscle of Continuation, 